Are we in need of a new kind of Christianity? With the social landscape changing, what is the theological question of our times? Is it the question of evil, of the end times, or of a spirituality that should better encompass the ecology? Indeed, it's a combination of all those things. But ultimately, I think it is the question of a theology of place. Most of the world's population right now is in lockdown. The mantra is hashtag stay home, because that will offer salvation to the world. St. George's finds itself in the heart of Johannesburg, which has the highest concentration of COVID-19 cases in South Africa. What is the gospel? What is the good news to this city? In Acts chapter 2, verse 14, Peter, the apostle standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed the crowd. People of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. In verse 22, he says something similar. People of Israel, hear these words. There's an affirmation of the same kind of message. A message that goes on to address a multi-ethnic group of people characteristic to any city. A message that penetrates and identifies the power holders of the social landscape. Right now in South Africa and in the global south of the world, there is in fact a decline of the autonomy of the nation state. With failing economies, there is a growing and greater dependency on race rating agencies of loans provided by the BRICS Bank or the IMF. There's growing tensions between, in our country, between constitutionalists and securocrats. The health sector seems to be opposed to the markets. And within this vacuum of uncertainty, there is, however, a unifying transnational social force, and that is the church. Of course, the church could be characterized also as having a social ideology. And in the global South, that is typically marked by fundamentalism. And yet this place, the place of the global South, there's an outcry for liberation. Liberation from the class struggles. There are people trapped in slums in this very city right now. And that is characteristic of urbanization. And yet there is an equalizing force, and that is the means of digital media. Creating a communion of communities, as it were, where there are virtual identities. And these virtual means are indeed creating urbanization of the whole world. But we can use that means to fulfill the mission of God as the word was sent, the incarnate Logos that was sent by God into this world to offer the gospel. Understanding that this word is transversal, it cuts across social orders. This word is polysemic in that it has multiple meanings that can be ascribed uh, to it, depending on the narrative of your specific community. But the word's properties could be either regarded as analogous or univocal. In other words, the properties that we ascribe to the word, are they uh, equal to human virtues? Or are they similar, yet an analogy to the goodness of God? Because we can't really actually attain the transcendent glory of God in his substance. Because understanding that he and we are in this continuous differentiating process of defining and ascribing different meanings to God's glory and the properties of the word. And so what does the good news, the message of freedom, offer to, to the people? Understanding that we want to be prophetic and our prophetic words, which has confrontational potency, is it relative or is it absolute? The three components to that, to that message is that of liberty, 
dialogue and enculturation. Acknowledging that liberation without dialogue just becomes activism. Dialogue without enculturation produces cultural elitism. And enculturation with dialogue but without liberation just produces escapism. So our very linguistics, the words that should offer freedom, needs to encompass this understanding that the church should be a diaconal community, a serving church. Because, because by being a serving church, we can't also then be an imperialistic church. The, this message is what David, um, is, what, is what we seek to emulate David's words when he says, he dwells in hope. That inheritance has fallen on beautiful places, he says. The Apostle Peter goes on to define it as an inheritance that is unfading, undefiled and imperishable. It's a place of interiority. It's where the church becomes contemplative in that upper room because there the Holy Spirit empowers us so that when we do go out into the public square, we speak into truly the aspirations of humans. And it's not a populist discourse. It should be a selfless message of true freedom. And the question of place then is a question of centrality. Understanding that all pain are not common to all people. I don't suffer like the Gogo and Alex who has to look after three or four children and try to make ends meet. But we do share the common value and virtue of hope and a desire for healing of the nations. And the gospel of the word should help us to define a theology of place, to outline it so that it also helps in creating a transcendent sacred space that seeks the liberation of people and the well-being of all. Jesus, in reference to his re uh, resurrection, says that he's going to prepare a place for us because in his father's house there are many rooms. A theology of place, I believe, lays the foundation for us to start looking to the larger scene and to start making room for others. Amen.